hi to everyone and, and thanks for coming. Uh, there are uh, two things. The, the first one is that uh, we, we are going to, to uh, well, Am Amleto here uh, is going to explain a, a, an app for, for, for your mobile. Um, it's it's in, in, in beta, in a beta phase, and he will explain better than me. But uh, he asked us if, if he could, uh, if we could uh, use it and try, because they are starting. There, there's a, there's a, there's this. Uh, they have this initiative, and they are they are starting. They they work with with different meetups, and we thought that it's good to support local initiatives, and and we thought that it might be a good thing. So so we are going to to try for 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 some time, and and well, I think that it it, it makes hace uh, buena pinta. And if you if you feel so, um, we will send information how to download it and install and so on. And and I think that any comment you can send him a, an email saying, oh, this is not working or or whatever. Um, but okay, that that that's the thing we're going to to try. So uh, first of all, he's going to to make a small uh, introduction about the app, and then Carlos Castillo is going to to make the the, the presentation um, about a crisis situation using using big data and. He will introduce himself better than me, but he, he's a, the, the director of, of data mining at, at Eurecat, Eurecat, which is a, a research center here in, in, in Catalonia. And he's done many things, and many interesting things, so I, I hope you, you enjoyed, enjoyed the talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leish. I uh, really appreciate what you're doing for us. Uh, so, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about Flutter. It's going to be quick. Uh, but how many of you have been to meetups before? OK, really good. How many of you have met a, a meetup more than five pers people? One? How many? OK. How many of you have actually left a meetup thinking that actually they missed out on meeting great people and they didn't know who they were? OK. OK. Good. That's Flutter. Um, uh, we are building, a, it's, it's a company, it's a platform, uh, it's not just an app, but what we are trying to do is actually allowing communities to come together. And uh, I actually go to quite a few meetups, uh, professionally based meetups, uh, things about business. Uh, and um, many times I leave and, uh, or a conference too and I, I, I think, okay, actually I'm missing probably a lot of the interesting people I could meet, I don't know who they are, I just generally talk to the people that are next to me. Uh, sitting next to me or drinking a beer next to me, and I think it's a, it's a shame. Uh, and the other thing is that generally between meetups, there's a lot of knowledge that could be shared, but actually it's impossible if you don't know everybody that is in the meetup, and for example, the meetup forum or the comments uh, doesn't work. So what we are trying to do is try to build a, a platform where uh, professionals that, that share the same passions could actually interact uh, and also meet each other. And then the idea is also to expand that and allow different communities in different places that share the same sort of topic uh, to meet each other uh, virtually and hopefully physically too. So uh, this is the beta version that it's, it's not a beta version, you'll see it works extremely well now. Uh, but basically there are a couple of functions. One is members geolocation. So for example, if you download the app, you can see everybody that is here and you could see their profiles and then connect with them. And the idea is that that way you could actually meet people that might be useful for you to work with or might be interesting to meet uh, and to have a discussion with. Uh, but then if you see point number two, that's the point where you'll find the professional communities. So now we have a few professional communities in Flutter. You will find the machine learning Barcelona BCN in there and that the idea is now you'll see it later, but that you can share things. You can share doubts, questions, uh, everything you want, articles, uh, and everything you want. And then, uh, if somebody's posting, uh, that gives access to a professional, uh, to a profile, a clickable profile, so you can see who that person is, the LinkedIn profile, and decide if you want to meet them or not. One other feature is the actually the members' feedback. So if somebody, we don't like spam, we hate spam actually. Uh, so the idea is that if somebody's spamming and making advertisement, you can downvote, 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 and that will send flags to us and will remove that person from the group. That is the idea. It's pretty harsh, but uh, it's necessary. Uh, and the other thing is you can upvote. If somebody you see is posting good things, the idea is to upvote them, and then 
what we want to do is basically a weekly digest or and a monthly digest where the best posts, the ones that get more upvotes, get sent out and shared with the community and uh, other communities too. Uh, you, there's quite a few more functionalities like chats that you can see in there, but the most important ones are these ones. Uh, the one is the first one is around me. So there's a functionality in it to see whoever is around you and uh, decide what, what you want to do. Now in the app, we have about 100 people and there are actually some very interesting profiles. So the first one, you know it, it's Alesh. Uh, the second one, uh, she's a data scientist that we met uh, and she has an amazing background. So if, once you have the open, uh, I suggest you to go in and, uh, and look for her. Uh, and then the third one, uh, she is a guy that actually built a company in San Francisco, sold it to Apple, worked for Apple two years, and now he's here, he's here in Barcelona, and he has an extre extreme wealth of knowledge about everything that is going on in the, in, the, in the valley, if you're interested. The second part that is interesting is my feed. So for example, there I shared a, an article that I found extremely interesting about deep learning. Uh, there's a lot of debate ongoing, and uh, as you know, about uh, deep learning and AI. But the idea is that you can share anything. If you want to share an article, ask questions, and the community is the thing for the community to, to learn. Our objective is for people to grow in their passion and topics uh, by interacting with other professionals. So that's the whole objective of Flutter. Uh, so, I mean, a few things. Uh, there, there's definitely direct communication that generally you miss between meetups. Uh, there's continuous interaction that you can have uh, with other people that participate in this community. You can establish new connection, but then the idea is to grow the community because if it becomes a kind of an ongoing thing, more, in more interesting people will come in because they know this great community and more interesting will become for all of you too. Uh, so as I said, grow the sense of community, uh, the whole objective of it is to create quality interactions, and that's what we're trying to do, and there's no cost, I mean, it's free for everybody. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we are not looking for money at this point at all. So, I mean, this is Flutter. If you want to download it, I actually posted uh, two things uh, in the comments of the meetup. One are the, the uh, Wi-Fi details, so you can connect to the Wi-Fi, you can get a good connection, and then you need to go to flutter.in, like uh, Fluttering will be and then basically you put your email address and we'll send you the invitation out and you can download the app okay thank you um, <coughs> another thing uh, we, we are not a very large crowd so don't be shy and ev everything that you want to ask please ask Carlos and, and it's, uh, it's quite informal so don't be don't be shy and and ask. Okay now? Okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. So yes, as Alex said, uh, we can make this more like uh, conversational and, and interrupt me. And I have a ton of slides. And it doesn't matter if we see only a few of them and then uh, we discuss more and learn more. Um, so this talk is not about machine learning. It's about uh, applied computing and where, where there are some elements that are uh, from um, machine learning you will, you will see. It's more like how, how you can apply some very simple uh, techniques to a very interesting problem. So I work on crisis data and disasters data. So I always look for uh, emergency exits, so this room has four, two in the back, two in the front, and one bicycle here. So if there is a fire, you can jump over the bicycle and then exit the, through the emergency exit. It's gonna be fun. Um, I study the information retrieval and I work on a lot of things that are not really much interest to you right now, but, but I think what's really interesting is that most of this work I did while I was in Qatar. Uh, Qatar is that tiny peninsula attached to a larger peninsula, which is the Arab Peninsula. It's an Islamic state. It has, it has the largest GDP per capita in the world, far exceeding the one of uh, many uh, European countries. Um, it, has, uh, it is very uh, secretive about their demographics, so that's, that's why the question mark are there, like 1.5 maybe, blue-collar workers, and then about uh, 500K, 
white collar workers, 300k citizens. They have a big, uh, they put a lot of importance in education and science. And this is, uh, this here was at the end of uh, 2015. Mid 2015, this, the, the social computing team there. And this, um, this was the best day I had in Qatar. It's a, it's a desert actually, so there is very little to do. And the, the best you can do is you stand in the, in the desert and look at the sea. This is the skyline of, uh, of Doha, which is the only city that is there uh, in Qatar. It's a very interesting place, and most of this work by, was funded by them. Now, bringing us back to the topic of the talk, if you remember what happened in um, um, March this year, uh, there were these explosions in the Brussels airport, uh, and then there are um, many things, and as, you, as, you, as I mentioned in talking data beers. Uh, it's interesting to, to see what the police asked to the people who were in Brussels. So the police asked them to use social media, not to use the phone. They asked them to avoid the streaming when it was possible, and they asked them to avoid sharing real-time information about police actions. Okay, three things. Now, this being uh, the internet, of course, people will do exactly the opposite. So you will see a lot of information in real time. This is unavoidable. And this, was, this happened like a few hours after the attacks. Uh, I took these screenshots and you, you can see um, almost 3,000 words in the Wikipedia article. Now if you look at the Wikipedia article for the Orlando shootings, there is a lot of information there. There are lots of references, um, many YouTube videos, uh, Facebook pages, images, photos, uh, a, a posting in Reddit with 17,000 comments, uh, and so on. There's a, there is a lot of data uh, here. Now, the, the talk is about uh, disasters. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about the domain. I think it's interesting to look a bit more in the domain, and then you can think of what are your ideas in which, uh, the ways in which uh, maybe your work can contribute to this domain, uh, about social media, about computing, and so on. So, on a lighter note, the, the guys in Twitter did this video some time ago. Maybe you have watched it. What, what you can do with the social media. Now, if you, if you think of this, if you try to do the math of this thing, okay, can I receive actually a tweet before uh, I get a shock waste from an earthquake? Uh, the answer is more or less yes, right? So you have uh, um, uh, some speed for the for the seismic waves, uh, you have some speed for the tweets, and one is much faster than the other. So you can have, like, a, after 100 kilometers, some messages about a, an earthquake overtaking the actual earthquake. Now, I started to work on this topic in uh, January 2010. Uh, I was in Barcelona at the, at the moment, um, and there was this big earthquake in Chile. Uh, this is uh, in Concepcion, in the south of Chile. And uh, I called some of my colleagues at the University of Chile. It was my um, alma mater. And I, I, I asked them if they were OK and if their house was OK. And I also asked them if they wanted to do a paper out of what happened, right? And they said that something that was very interesting to them was whether social media, and Twitter in particular, contributed to the chaos that uh, followed in some areas. Uh, the earthquake and to the feelings of unsafety of the of the people during the earthquake and so on. So there were many research questions there. We eventually ended up working in some of those questions. I, I will show you in the in the rest of the presentation. This this um, this, this research belongs to a, an area that you may or may not have been in contact with, which is humanitarian computing, which are all these applications of of computing to humanitarian. Uh, issues like uh, analyzing and managing a crisis, uh, seeing how mobile phones can be useful, crowdsourcing, human computer interaction, NLP, etc. So, no matter what field are you coming from, maybe there is something for you to contribute to, this, to these areas. And of course, in, in all the field of uh, humanitarian computing topics, social media studies is the part in which this talk is mostly focused. So we have uh, here all the ingredients for doing interesting applied research. Uh, the problem is of global significance because everywhere there are disasters. In Europe, the most damaging disasters are floods. 
Uh, in other places are typhoons, hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, droughts, and so on. The current way in which people make sense of all these thousands of comments and thousands of tweets and videos is mostly manual. So there is a lot of, there are attempts to try to make sense of what the public do, does during a crisis, but they are mostly based on monitoring the tweet, uh, Twitter feeds and Facebook pages and so on, so it's manual. Uh, so if you, we can do it automatically. Um, if you provide a better solution, you have a public good. We have data sets, I will point you to some data sets. And there are also volunteer communities. And all that, uh, there is a tiny detail to, that remains to be tested is whether what we can provide is relevant to, uh, to practitioners. Of course, it's not a tiny detail, but it's a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lingering question over many of, the, many of the things. In some cases, I would claim that we have actually made a difference. In other cases, I would say uh, it's not clear that we are providing anything better. Now, this whole research uh, program of trying to understand what the public says during a disaster in social media is not motivated by what is the best way of facing a disaster. It's not that we have emergency responders or humanitarian agencies telling us, okay, what do you think is the best that we can, the best way in which we can improve disaster response? And we said, hey, yeah, Facebook and Twitter are your best allies. I don't think that's the case. Uh, this, this research starts from the other side. It starts from, okay, there is a certain phenomenon. There are these thousands of messages, photos, videos. What can we do with them? There is, uh, there is certainly something we could do with them. Then you can say, well, it's very noisy. It comes from the internet. Uh, I don't know if it's true or false, but this is the life we live. We navigate these questions all the time. So it's mostly about whether there, this object, which is like this activity can be mind in real time for something useful? And this is the question that we are trying to answer. And many collaborators that I'm um, very thankful uh, for, people like UCRI, at EPFL, Delhi, and Microsoft. Now, um, the, the point of this talk is disasters. So uh, this is, I'm gonna define disasters. The disasters are disruptions of routines. That a disaster is anything that changes the routines of people uh, in a city, and hence it's, a, it's, a social, it's, a, it's socially defined. Uh, what is a disaster in one place is not a disaster somewhere else. Uh, here um, in Beirut, there are three hours of, of, of uh, electricity per day, and there there is not a disaster that you have 20 hour, 21 hours without. Uh, in Barcelona, 21 minutes without electricity will be a, di a significant disruption of routines, and hence, could be are called a disaster. Um, something interesting for trying to kind of un unfold like what is this data that one can work with is to uh, understand that the, the people who study disasters, they tend to classify them ag according to several categories. One of those is, okay, whether this is a, a kind of a sudden onset disaster or something that progresses slowly, whether this is focalized in, in, in space, uh, whether this is natural or, or, or induced by humans. And there is, of course, the, the observation that a lot of people say that there are no natural disasters. I mean, the, the river may have flooded, but you choose to build a city next to the river. So it's not really entirely natural causes. Um, here are some examples. Now, most of what we, most of what we know about disasters is heavily modulated by what we learn from movies because we are exposed to a few disasters during our lifetimes, but they are not really uh, very generic uh, cases and we don't have enough data points to generalize well. So we tend to, I mean, this is what this, uh, the sociologists of, sociologists of disasters tell us, is that we tend to reason about emergency situations and disasters based on what we see in movies. It's very influential. So have you seen the movie on the left here, anyone? You have seen, you, you saw it in the entire thing? Is it good? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie is uh, called uh, Sharknado. And it's about, as the name suggests, a tornado that grabs sharks from the sea and throw them over a city. Is that, is that right? I, I have seen only the good piece, the good parts, not the entire the thing. Now, the, the right side is a real disaster. These are floods in Brazil. Of course, they look very differently, but I'm perhaps picking a very particular data point. This is more interesting. So the, the, the left frame 
is something that no movie director would ever film, most likely. Like, I've never seen a scene like that in a movie. So you have an airplane that is in flames, and people are kind of walking, like, very matter-of-factly with the bags. There was a lot of criticism about against these people, right? Also because the instructions say, leave your luggage behind and abandon the airplane, and everybody is carrying their backpack, and nobody's running or anything. And the ride is, is from a movie. Uh, I don't know which movie, but it's more like a disaster... A, a, a more, you would say, this is a more faithful portrayal of what is a disaster, right? And I would claim, no, it's because we are used to see disasters in a certain way. This is relevant for what, what we can expect. Like in real life, it's true that some people panic, but a lot of people don't panic. They gather information from sources that are familiar to them, the people who are around them, mass media, social media, phones, whatever they can grab, whatever we can grab when there is a uh, disaster situation. And you have to decide what to do, whether you are fleeing, you are staying, you are gathering water, what are you going to do in this situation? And a lot of people improvise these rescue operations like on the spot. So this, this mindset in which you say, well, the public is actually actively trying to get themselves out of trouble or solve the disaster, it's a very peculiar mindset that is not the mindset of many emergency, emergency management organizations and governments and so on. So as a researcher, you have to first like say, okay, there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of try to free myself from this view from the movies that people run in circles panicking. I'm gonna say, well, there are some people who panic, but there is a lot of people who are actually very um, capable of getting themselves out of trouble. And uh, the way in which they do it involves the usage of communications technology and, and information technologies and social media. These are some messages that are handpicked by uh, researchers that uh, from the crisis informatic area have studied this problem. Uh, these are handpicked because the majority of what you read in social media as more equally to the majority of the books, the majority of the music and the majority of the internet is crap. It's very little, it's, there is very little information out there, there is repetition and so on, but there are these very peculiar messages that are very informative because they contain something that you cannot get from other sources. Uh, you, you do not know, maybe you do not know exactly what's the height of the water in a place, maybe this is, this is one of the messages that broke the news when there were this attack in Norway. So the, the, the first news about this disaster were actually posted in social media. So then the question is, can we try to very quickly, as this thing happens, detect immediately that, it's, uh, that, that, that something is going on? Um, now, the scale of this thing is actually large, but not so large. So it's large, but manageable. Uh, it's large for humans, but it's not uh, large from, from, let's say, uh, like a big data perspective. So the day the Pope Francis was elected, the peak uh, rate in Twitter was 2,000 messages per second. Now there is 2,000, I mean, a, a tweet is like four kilobytes, so it's not really a ton of information, right? It's, 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 it's a small quantities of information. Now, what's in, what happens is that it's coming very fast, and in those 2,000 messages about the Pope elected, maybe there is some interesting information. Maybe somebody started shooting someone. Maybe somebody planted a bomb somewhere. Maybe uh, there is a reaction that is very important that one needs to handpick from that, from, from what's going on there. The same, now in, the, in typical disaster situations, you observe like hundreds, 500, 1,000 tweets per second, and much more in videos, Instagram photos, uh, and many other sources. So the, I, I, I work in this group with, uh, when, when I was working in the crisis informatics team until last year, we were trying to, uh, collaborating with the UN and with other agencies, trying to answer like two sets of requirements that are very different. And maybe they also have appeared in, in, in kind of applications for data mining that you have built that use uh, citizen data. Uh, some people want to, uh, the, this, the, the second point is the easiest. This is, this is what, what we tend to focus on. 
when we build these applications, not only for disaster, like in general, when we do mining of uh, public information, citizen information, there, there is a lot of uh, focus on the second part, which is, okay, I, want, I have like all these reports from a city, all this information. I want to find like uh, two or three best uh, restaurants. I want to find uh, two or three places where people need water in this catastrophe. I want to find uh, where the shooting is taking place and so on. So I want these actionable insights. And there are some groups of people, for instance, the police, emergency services, medical services, that are deeply interested in this kind of requirement. They, ha they want to know these actionable insights. And your job is to take this data stream and select those. But there is another part that is much less explored uh, from a data perspective, which is to try to understand the big picture. So there are agencies that ask us like a very, in a very direct manner, okay, can you tell us like in five minutes after the typhoon uh, passed through the capital of a country, can you tell us more or less how many people were injured or how many houses will need to be rebuilt uh, or how, what is the amount of damages that the typhoon caused, uh, caused like based on these preliminary observations? The answer is no, I mean, no, not yet. But then the, the question is, then what is, what is the right mechanism to do something like that? So can you tell us from, in, in the case of other types of application, could you be able to tell from all the social media activity around Barcelona whether employment is gonna recover next year or not? Uh, or whether there is, a, whether house prices are going, are going up or down? Like all these kind of big picture questions are, have received much less attention than the questions related to kind of uh, actionable data points. Of course, you can build the big picture with the actionable data, with the po data points, with the isolated data points, but perhaps there is some way of modeling this directly. Okay, I'm gonna pause. Yeah, is there any, I, I haven't given you time for questions, but is there any questions so far? Comment, anything? Okay, I will move on then. So the, the typical, uh, the, the the typical thing that you do when you are facing like okay coming back to the disaster scenario you have this stream of uh, messages about the disaster and you want to do something with them right so the typical reflex of uh, uh, data mining is to classify things of course now um, for classifying messages you really need to be able to do some text mining so how, how many of you work in NLP natural language processing so anyone one, two people, right. The rest, a bit with text. One, great. So I, I think what's, what's, what I will say is that most people that work on machine, no, no, most people who work, people who work in machine learning are not afraid of text. But I would say people who work in computing in general are afraid of text. Uh, people tend to work only with data that they can, that, that, that is kind of readily available. Like people tend to be very, comfortable working with a data table and now with the nested columns. Now there's no problem, uh, like some structure, time series, people are very comfortable working with that. People are deeply uncomfortable working with text, uh, particularly um, computer scientists and computing engineers. They say, well, I'm not an NLP person, so, uh, or I don't know how to process text. I mean, maybe not you, but I've seen a lot of people who, who react in this way when you tell them, okay, let's try to understand what people are saying in this city, what people are saying in this disaster. And the truth is that you don't need to know much to work with text. So there are many tools, uh, there are many well-established methods, there are mature software libraries, there are libraries for doing anything like uh, dependency parses, identity uh, extraction, linking. There are lots of tools that are readily available in case you want to understand text, which brings me to the um, um, Chinese room analogy. Do you know it? Have you heard about this thing, Chinese room? Yeah. Okay, that's enough for me. I'm gonna skip it. But if you want to some interesting reading, take the look for this thing. It's really interesting, and it, and you get a better sense of why I'm telling you that you shouldn't be afraid of text. Other times you do need to be afraid of text. So for instance, take this uh, this kind of message that um, is posted in social media. So try to parse it with your um, eleven thousand million neurons and see what comes out of it. So, um, so to understand this message, you, you, first this is probably beyond the reach of a computing algorithm, beyond the reach of most people, unless you're familiar with Indian politics. Uh, 
because there are lots of context information here. So there is a um, China and C is, an, uh, is a member of the parliament. Uh, RSS is not the party of China and C, but it's a party that is has close ties to to the party of China and C. And the photo on the left, uh, which represents um, a party militia going to help in Nepal for the earthquake, is actually an old photo. It's a photo from two or three years ago. So in order to understand this, you need a lot of context. It cannot be done independently. So understanding social media, like trying to extract meaning from this content is very difficult. You, you are basically looking at a conversation. Uh, there are people use fragmented language that is not grammatically correct, full of typos, uh, abbreviations, and lots of other things. And it's also conversational. So people answer to each other. And then if you don't know the history of the conversation, it's difficult. So understanding this in general is not so, so easy. So for instance, this was after the, the attacks in Belgium. Both messages, you can understand them as, uh, both, both messages show sympathy in very different ways. But they are both ways of sympathizing with uh, Belgian, the Belgian people. Slang is easy to, to manage. And then, well, typically you start classifying this thing. So um, let me show you some, some example, like more domain specific example, like uh, what we did, like classifying these, these messages from social media. So these are the, um, I mean, maybe I, maybe I can, I can show you this for instance. So um, this is, these uh, colored bars are, each one of these bars represent a disaster. Uh, these are data samples from Twitter. And uh, for instance, the left one is an earthquake in Costa Rica in 2012, uh, floods in Manila in 2013, uh, Typhoon Pablo, floods, floods in Sardinia, uh, an earthquake in Guatemala. Um, there is, a, there is the, 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 the next to last is the derailing of that train in Galicia in 2013. You remember? This happened in, uh, in Galicia, a, a, a high speed train was going even higher than necessary. And, uh, um, it derailed. So the, the colors are types of messages. And, and something that we observed like very early in this research was that uh, there, something that sociologists of disaster have also said that uh, disasters are very different, but they have very common elements. And people tend to um, more or less worry about the same things. So they, they, they start first like, okay, well, things such as, okay, what is the, uh, what is the main uh, what is the main problem? Like uh, trying to advise people on what to do, trying to warn them about the danger. Um, affected individuals is the yellow part. The blue part is in the infrastructure, like things that are damaged. Green is donations. Um, pink is sympathy, and uh, the last part is useful information. And, and how, how do you do you know that this is from Twitter? It's from Twitter, and it's uh, done with a um, with a combination of. Um, Crowdsourcing and cl uh, classification, like automatic classification. What, what crowdsourcing? crowdsourcing. So we use some, some. Um, uh, we use a crowdsourcing platform like uh, Mechanical Turk to collect, um, like Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, that is called Crowdflower, and this we use to collect labels. And with those labels, we train a classifier, and when we're confident, we start labeling data. So it costs money. It costs money. Yeah. So doing this study costed some money, but it doesn't cost to you because the data is free are free now. So, uh, there is this website, crisislex.org. There are like nine or 10 data sets by now. We have been collecting data sets about disasters. They are good for machine learning exercises. If you are into teaching, it's also interesting for, for, for showing something. They are good for demos, like a small demos on, on, a, on some useful topic. Um, Yeah. Here it's a bit in the other way around, right? I mean, from, from this, it's, it's, it's like a clear picture, but, but you don't know what to do with it. Right. So this, this is, I mean, it's interesting what can we, so suppose you take a disaster and you say, well, in this disaster, there were, there are lots of messages about donations and very few about uh, infrastructure damage. Now, we did, several attempts at relating that 
with actual physical variables from the disaster, like for instance, official reports of people dead, injured, and so on, houses damages. We never succeeded. So this was, after, we tried in many ways in norm, of normalizing the data, of interpreting like what should we count, like one tweet, one person, should we normalize by the, by the activity in this part of the world in the previous week when there was no disaster and so on. So we had some data set that was very appropriate for this, which was a typhoon in the Philippines that affected several islands. And then we knew in each island what was the amount of damages, infrastructure damage, and um, injured people, and so on. And we, wanted, and we had the Twitter data, and there is some correlation, of course, but it's not really uh, obvious how this variable respond to the actual magnitude of the disaster. We have the conjecture that, uh, that this is, is concave. So if you have, um, if nothing happens, then nobody tweets, like nobody posts tweets about disaster, right? If something mild happens, then people start getting more um, excited, like they, they write more about this, this thing that is happening. Now, if the thing is really serious, then they start uh, having less time or less inclination to post about this in social media. And this is, I mean, it's a, if a meteorite wipes the earth, then there will be zero message in the, in the extreme, right? And then maybe there is a sweet spot where the disaster is really important, but it leaves you enough time and, in, and inclination to try to post some information. So it's a weird relation. I, this is why this is difficult. Um, no answer yet. So we also observe a, prog a progression of these things over time. And this was uh, across 26 disaster. And now, even if you think of the Orlando shooting, well, there is no infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure damage is not the most important issue. Uh, in other cases, it is. Uh, but there is like this, this progression where people say, well, look out, there is a shooting. People should leave the Pulse uh, nightclub. And then people start expressing their sympathy, support, and then describing, OK, who was killed, who was injured, and then trying to give other, other information that's more specific, and then donations and volunteering, sometimes in a framework of days, sometimes in a shorter framework. This is very, of course, disaster, every disaster is different, but there, is some, there are some commonality, commonalities. Um, you can extract information from these uh, tweets. You can extract like uh, what's the important part of the, of the message, what is the time, uh, what, who is the person posting this message. You can, there are many things that, that one can do track hashtags, uh, URLs, and this is some, some example of, of information extraction here. Um, these are the same, yes? One question. How do you process uh, the tweets coming in um, written in different languages? Because you have to do some, let's say, yeah. processing and analyzing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's true. We, we typically uh, created like separate collections per language because this are many, all of these things are language specific. The, uh, you can, I mean, in some cases, like when, when you need like a quick and dirty solution, you can build like a classifier that works across, across languages. Like uh, in many cases here, you have no, I mean, so far, there is very little data to bootstrap like a classifier. Like if, you, if, if there is something happening today in Barcelona, um, a bombing, will we have a classifier for Catalan and Spanish and English uh, that, that can classify that information? Maybe not, that we need to bootstrap it with some uh, training data from before, or we need to, uh, well, we have a classifier and we try to transfer it to the new setting. I mean, it's very, you, to, you may, maybe you need to translate. Um, um, it's complicated. So in general, I mean, we were very pragmatic and we said, okay, different collections per language, but maybe one can do something better. That's a good point. And, and the same with information extraction is not only for classification. So, so another thing that we did it, um, was to try to identify people asking for something with people needing something. And this, this was done independently by other group also in Japan. And they came up with a solution that was very similar to ours. Uh, so you basically try to locate this, this kind of, uh, the important part of the tweet. Like you have, a, you have a phrase, I mean, the tweet is 140 characters, but it has a part that is more important than the rest. Uh, the home, I mean, the, the wind, uh, 
Is it about donation of blood? Is it about the closing of the bridges? So you try to identify like the, 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 the central part, which is the problem, and then try to identify the, per the central part, which is the solution in some other message, and then try to match these uh, donations, right? So not only based on, on text, we have, in the end we have very small precision, but um, if you use text, you, you can do even worse. And so if, you, if you, you're able to kind of first try to identify the important part, is, you can be better. Right. The, so the, the the problem with the matching is that the, there are very few messages that in, involve uh, quanti quantities. So we don't know, for instance, uh, suppose I say there is a shelter open in this street, right? Think of a hurricane. Okay, there is a shelter open in this street. And people say, where I can find a shelter? And then you say, well, there is a shelter there. How many people accommodate that shelter? I don't know. Right? People don't, don't post this, this information. Uh, the same with the uh, food donations and so on. You don't know if the place is saturated or not. Um, so it's tricky, yes. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't get into much complexity, but saying, okay, this tweet is the solution to this, th this message is the solution to this problem. This, this, this is the evaluation, and this is the 21%. So in 21% of the cases, one in five, we were able to find a solution to the problem, which means you will have to scan five uh, messages in order to find a solution instead of 300 per minute or whatever it is. Yeah. So here we use uh, uh, something similar to what part of a speech taggers do. So they have, they have these uh, structured learning models where uh, the input is a binary vector, right? The input, in this case, think, think of the, the input is a, the input, la the, the, the input labels are a binary vector. This binary vector has a zero whenever this part is not the important part and a one whenever this part is the important part, right? It's in, annotated by experts. So you have this expert who annotated this vector in this way. And now you're learning, and now the features are a matrix that has in every of these positions in the, in the text have a series of features. Right? One feature can be the word itself. Another feature can see, well, this is capitalized, completely capitalized. Another feature can say, this is a word of length too and so on. So you have for every word, uh, the, the f instead of having a feature vector, you have a feature matrix uh, that has for every position in the text several characteristics of the word at that position. And now your labels, instead of being a, a, a scalar, is a, is a vector. And now your learning method is mapping from uh, the matrix of features to this vector of labels. So this is how you you train this thing. These are used, uh, the, the, the particular learning scheme is a conditional random field, uh, which is um, a model that is like a, like a chain, like every state depends on the, uh, every label depends on the label to the right and to the left of that label, and so on. So that, that it, represents the it represents the dependencies on that way. So that is how it works. Now, that thing is the same way in which a part of a speech tagger annotates that this thing is the verb in a phrase. So the, the same way in which a part of speech tagger recognizes that this is a verb is the same method that we use to recognize that this is the important part in a phrase. Okay. Actually, we, we didn't even, we, we just changed the training data. We didn't even implement a new thing. There's a, a sort of a training set for uh, any crisis or... Uh, Here for language, yeah. Uh, points to a, a crisis, you already know uh, how it's... Going yeah. On. So this, this is uh, here, yeah, it's a good, uh, good question, right? So, so for instance, <laughs> okay, so this, this will reflect typical. So Joplin was a um, tornado in uh, Missouri, I think, in the US in 2012, and Sandy was the hurricane in 2013. So if you train on data annotated for the Joplin tornado and you test on data annotated for the hurricane Sandy, you get a recall of 11% and a precision of 78%. Right? If you train on, if you train on Joplin plus a bit of Sandy and you test on Sandy, then your numbers increase. So this is, this is sensitive to whether your training set corresponds to, has information that is current 
about the current disaster instead of just historical information. Of course, this is this is kind of the, the crappiest uh, domain adaptation method you can use. Instead of trying to change the model, we just add a bit of training data examples from the from the uh, second setting. So we have like a, in, 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 this is all practical, right? In practice, we had like a stack classifier. So the first level is, okay, is this a tweet that is relevant for the disaster or not? And, and that, is the, that is the most generalizable model that we found. Because you, across disasters, there, across these 26 or whatever training that we had, there is a fairly uh, kind of consistent informative tweet. It is, it is a tweet that is long, it contains places and locations, it is well capitalized, it doesn't end with a smiley, like it has like a certain shape of what's a well written. So you, you start with that and you filter a lot of things and then you start digging into, okay, what category this is. Okay, this is a problem tweet. It's a tweet describing a, a problem, like a, and which type of problem? A death, injured person or damage infrastructure and utility, okay, and then you go to that branch and in that branch you, you start identifying, okay, what's, their name, what's the root of this problem? Uh, it's all practical. Um, so you remove a set of tweets, maybe, that uh, if there is an, an important tweet that has been tweeted uh, right. times, maybe you are removing all those. Right. Or, or things that are irrelevant. There is a lot of irrelevant information. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, the, tomorrow there can be an alien invasion and people will still be tweeting about, like, uh, lots of other things. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't go away with a disaster. Hey, uh, this is very weird. Uh, you have these this, this heavy disasters and people tweeting about like insane things. Like, okay, so let, uh, um, it's, it's 8 p.m. I'm gonna go until 8.20 maybe, is it okay? okay. 8.15 and then, uh, then. So um, disasters have a very important geographical component. And this is a visualization that was done in by the people in Facebook. I show it in the data beers, but now I can discuss a bit, a little bit in more detail. So these are the people who use the safety check. Uh, these are the friends of the people who use the safety check. Safety check is something that pops up in Twitter when you are in a disaster, in Facebook when you're in a disaster area. And then uh, these people in yellow are, um, that's gonna appear in a moment. Uh, these are people sending donations to Nepal and money. And people all over the world sending money to Nepal, from Japan, you see Australia, North America, Brazil, uh, Europe, um, lots of money flowing into this area. Now, the, the, just as people can contribute money, there are lots of people, and this is what makes this setting like really interesting, is that there are volunteers, there are people who are willing to provide these annotations. In the case of research, we use a mixture of paid annotations, like through Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower, plus volunteered annotations. So the volunteers annotations are, are much more, are, are much larger data sets. Um, volunteers are motivated, vo volunteering in, digital volunteering with respect to disasters has started with, uh, um, basically with the work of the people in Ushahidi, which is a, a company in Kenya, that uh, they, they have a platform for community powered mapping. And uh, this was picked up by this uh, guy, Patrick Meyer, he's uh, one of the pioneers in this space, and he, he, he is very fond of maps. Um, people have been producing these community-powered maps for a long time. Uh, these are more modern versions, like where is uh, Sika, uh, where, where is a pond of water, then for Syria, there have been maps running from a long time. Um, these are some of the maps that we produce in the um, in Qatar, uh, this is for Typhoon Pablo in the Philippines. And these are, um, these are maps produced, um, these are other types of maps, right? These are graphs, they also map things. Now, um, the, the maps I show are, are powered by people. These are powered by algorithms. So in this case, uh, this uh, uh, is researched by a group of people who study floods in Germany. The top part are the water levels, and the bottom part are is a kind of a heat map of the, um, of tweets 
saying something related to floats. And if you are really generous, you will see a, you will see a, a relationship between these two things. Now, interestingly, that here you can also see the biases. So this is um, um, this city is um, Mandelburg, I think, and it's the closest city to the river that was flooding. So it's kind of you have like I mean the physical phenomenon is you have a river that is that river, Elbe, Elbe River. The river Elbe that uh, goes in that trajectory and it goes through a par part of Germany that is not as inhabited as the rest. I mean, that's, there, is no, there are no huge cities in the Elbe River except for Mandenburg, which is this city. So in a sense, like the people bias, I mean, people are located there. So they kind of bias the reports towards themselves, right? You, you, you kind of see the flood where there is people. If there is no people, you don't see much of the flood. This is similarly done for dengue. Uh, if you look at the top, these are official reports from hospitals, like weeks after, uh, with a delay of weeks. And at the bottom, you have tweets. Of course, there, is, there are also biases here. So if you take a map of Brazil in terms of population density, maybe you produce a similar map and you make us believe that this is about dengue. So it's a lot of, I mean, these are kind of very preliminary. I, I find them very preliminary results because uh, they're still very heavily biased. This is a map of earthquakes in Italy. Uh, earthquakes are a very interesting case because you may think, you may believe that given that there are uh, the sensors, you can actually tell very fairly well what's the magnitude of an earthquake in a place. But the damage the earthquake does, does not depend entirely on the, uh, on the waves. It depends on hyper-local characteristics. It depends on well, what is the quality of this ground. It depends on the quality of the foundations of the building, the year of construction. Like it depends on so many things that uh, that are hyper local that you don't have, uh, even with a very dense network of sensors, you don't know where exactly are the dam the houses that you need to inspect or there will be damage. But people know. People can see cracks on the wall and so on and report them. And this is what this group of Italians did. Um, I worked for many years, in, uh, for, for a few years, in this uh, tool called Aether. Aether is a, is a mixture of uh, machine learning and crowdsourcing. Uh, it, it, it's actually two platforms that communicate with each other. Uh, on one hand, you have um, um, kind of a machine learning core, which is nothing more than Weka, wrapped in several layers of uh, things to be able to auto-configure and to be used by a non-expert. Uh, so you have a kind of a, a person who is interested in the disasters, go here, enter some keywords, start tracking some, some tweets about a disaster. And then uh, we also instantiate at the same time a micro mapping task on the other platform that communicates with the machine learning platform. So you get uh, examples that need to be labeled that are thrown to the crowdsourcing platform. And the from, from the crowdsourcing platform, we receive labeled examples. And we continue iterating this until be behind the scenes until, the, um, until we're satisfied with the quality of the classification. Now, what's interesting is that this is very easy to use. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't need to, and you don't, there, there is no, you don't need to select the algorithms or anything to, or the models or whatever you want to do. You just create your collection, and we on the background create a, a crowdsourcing task, and you invite volunteers to the crowdsourcing task, and this kind of self sustains. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have uh, a huge list of tweets, how do, you, how do you, like, from these, which are the ones that you will send to the... To the we, we do a, a simple version of active learning. So whenever we classify a tweet and we have low confidence, uh, those are priority to send them to the, machine, to the crowdsourcing platform. So uh, basically, we're, we're, we, we are choosing tweets that are close to the decision margin. So that's, yeah. It, so, I don't know. <laughs> so, it, it, the classification accuracy is, is decent often. Like, you, you get like a, a good, you can get very quickly a separation of messages that are about the disaster from messages that are not, like, and you can set up your own things. This kind of works. I mean, the, uh, we, we were very careful to kind of choose like models that maybe are not perfect for one particular situation, but that they generalize well across several situations. Um, we need in the order of a few hundred messages per category to be able to create a, new cl a good classifier. And that was 
well within the reach of the volunteers. So I think like Taifu Pablo is, 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 is world news and, they, and we get maybe um, 1,000 volunteers and some of them produce like 1,000 labels. So, I mean, it's, uh, we get a lot of, I mean, the, in the, it's, it's of course it's very heavily skewed, but you get some people who do a lot of work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm th that's a problem I'm still uh, worried about and concerned about. I, I wouldn't say working on because I don't have like even a good path to solution. But the biases are a big problem. But and biases are a big problem in all of social media research. Uh, there, there are ways, like uh, there are ways of overcoming bias. We, we, we have a, um, we, gave, we gave a tutorial like uh, about uh, a month ago uh, on biases in social media research and, and most of the answers that we, we were suggesting to this problem were related to, to, to doing a careful, like, a careful dis design that is similar to an observational study design, like a natural experiment design. So you have uh, things such as, okay, you have uh, these two cities in Brazil and they are about the same size and they are about the same population and one of them is reporting this amount of tweets on dengue and the other is reporting this amount of tweets. Then I have a data point that says, well, maybe this city has more dengue than the other because their underlying characteristics are similar. And if you, if you generalize that, you can have like a propensity score. You can have, okay, according to what I know, according to everything I know about these cities, the probability of observing a tweet about dengue in this city is this much, in the other city is this much. And now I look at, I, stratify the cities by this probability and in each bucket I compare cities that are equally likely to tweet about dengue or to write about dengue. So there are some designs that one can try to do to, to try to remove bias. But it's tricky because this is, in, in the end this is kind of an, you, you, are, you are not controlling anything, you're just observing what's going on and then you cannot tell people, okay, now please start, please go outside and see if there is a hurricane, like people will self-select and, I mean, you have all the possible biases. Um, um, yeah. Do you compare the, the model with another, another, another stock? So this is one, I mean, the, in, in the screen there is one, one comp I mean, the one comparison that one can do. But we did compare with, for instance, the, um, in this uh, ca same case, like uh, Philippines, like uh, damage in each island and so on. And there is some relationship, but it's not enough to so be able to say. The reason, causal reason of relation is in correlation between the source, the problem in this case, the biggest, the biggest source, and, and the real one source. Yeah, so there is some, I mean, it's, I mean, it's clear that people on the, on, in social media start speaking about an earthquake when there is an earthquake. I mean, this is yeah. clear. Now, beyond that, whether, if the earthquake is stronger, how much more they will speak about the earthquake? That relationship is is not so clear. Uh, it's not at, at all, and the hurricane the same. And also, it's yeah, it's it's, it's messy, it's complicated. So uh, what we can show is like this type of graph. We we'll say, okay, this is the hurricane path. Those are the tweets. Uh, the the red are photos of things that were damaged. Well, most of the things that were damaged were most of the people who posted photos of things that were damaged in the Philippines were in the path of the hurricane, except for that guy in the bottom that uh, ruined our, our visualization. But um, the rest were all kind of in the path. But I mean, this also requires, it's, it's a lot of, um, I mean, it's a lot of empirical things, like try observe different situations and see what's, what happens. Okay, let me show you the last video and then go to the conclusions and then we close, we wrap up. So it, uh, maybe this needs a small introduction. So the, I think the, the, the end goal to me, I mean, one possible end goal is to be able to create systems that do real-time data mining using uh, crowdsourcing, using people, right? So you system for participatory mining of streams. Let me give you one example of that thing. So this is a UAV in Vanatu. 
uh, a Phantom DJ, this uh, like uh, I think this like six, 600 euro machine uh, that has four propellers and it can fly for 15 minutes. And what this is a, sim a simulation in the sense that this video was shown to a group of 50 volunteers online and they were asked to click whenever they see something, uh, whenever they see infrastructure damage, right? And then the, the system, what it's doing is just aggregating, for instance, that, that guy there thought this road is damaged and the other 49 said, no, this road is like that. So they didn't click on it. Uh, and the other, there is this long guy said, well, this is damaged, maybe not really, like it's not so damaged as, for instance, in the, on the right, like those, um, that, for instance, you see there, there is a rooftop that is missing. Uh, let's see in a moment. So the drone is looking in the wrong direction, but now it's coming back. So you see there is a rooftop missing, and then there is another one here on the right. So, so look at, the, uh, here I think what's interesting are the possibilities, right? So here, this is a, a pre-recorded video, but the, 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 the possibility is, okay, you can do a map of a crisis, like in the time it takes to fly the drone and then land it. Now, extrapolating this to other situations, I believe there is a lot of potential to create a real-time data mining system that uses a mixture of algorithms and people. And maybe you don't need a lot of people. Maybe you need just a few operators and like five, six people who sit there with you and watch this, whatever it is, like this news, this football game, uh, this disaster or this map of a city or these transit maps or whatever and with the help of algorithm help you make sense in real time of what's going on and generate an output that is valuable, right? So that's the kind of the vision, like have a system for data mining that can involve people and algorithms and work in real time. Maybe you can build something like that, maybe not, who knows. So is labeling all a crowd can do? What about validating? What about selecting features? What about generating hi hypotheses over the data or detecting biases and discrimination, suggesting an interpretation and so on? There are lots of things that people, humans can do and we could use them to, to try to understand the data. Okay, I will not speak much about this. Let me finish with the conclusions. So um, this research has good, bad and ugly aspects. The good part is that it's interdisciplinary, so you learn a lot and it's, it's, it's really, great the experience of talking uh, to people that are passionate about their own domain because given that you don't know anything you learn a lot i mean this is the, the best pet part of the learning curve is when you're at the beginning you know you don't know anything so every time you speak with them you, you end up thinking oh this is really cool and of course it's stuff that they have been doing for 50 years so uh, the bad thing is that uh, this particular domain has a lot of difficulties because these organizations are very old-fashioned and they are they are difficult to engage with and they 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 risk their their kind of their the organization is risking their life in every disaster because they are very easy to criticize right so they are exposed to criticism so all they do since day one is to start covering their backs this is very important because otherwise they don't survive and you cannot have a, an emergency administrator that is changed every time there is an emergency and the ugly thing is that, of course, you, you have like two competing things. You want to do your research and they want 24-7 support and so on. Um, the, this, this work, uh, I mean, most of what we do in um, data mining is here. We have the data and we have computers, so we do it. Um, there is a lot of, this space is smaller, but every now and then one can have like a good idea or a good partner and try to find something useful to do with this data but most of what we do is here, right? This, there is no shame thing in that, in recognizing that as long as we understand that we are trying to progress somewhere to this part. Uh, I, um, I wrote a book on this thing. Uh, it's called Big Crisis Data. If you are interested, you can search for Big Crisis Data and take a look at the table of contents and, and see if you like it. And if you have any other comment, you can write uh, uh, to me or whatever. That's it, thank you. Yeah, and will look in I will filter it as a uh, yeah. noise. <laughs> For me. Yeah. yeah. So any, if there is any comment, question? I have, I have a, a question with this, like a little bit. Uh, most of the work that you, you, you do uh, starts with, with human labeling. And I understand that if you're using like the whole Twitter, um, for different purposes, you, you uh, prefer one thing or, or other thing. What, what I'm 
translate to saying is, um, for di different purposes, you analyze differently. And, and uh, since there is a lot of uh, subjectivity, uh, it's like, uh, can you use the, in theory, the, the Bayesian point of view in machine learning is that you take the most of subjectivity to, to, make, to make good predictions. So somehow it seems that in your case that would make really sense because you start from human subjectivity, from the video that you uh, mm. um, uh, put uh, mm. start with people telling. So is Bayesian machine learning more useful for you than in other, than maybe in other applications or it's just something like we sometimes use it, we don't use it, do you know what I mean? It seems that in, the, in theory, it would be like a good application for, for Bayesian statistics. Yeah, I would say, I will agree with the, the fact that we are trying to, we are trying, essentially, we're trying to model what a human will say about this thing. This is a, a human, but it will be a human that has access to an inf information that this particular labeler doesn't have. So I don't know. Because it, I mean, it's partially true. It's true. That it's true. The part that we uh, we're essentially concerned with uh, reproducing faithfully what a human will live. But it's it's also true that that person is deciding based on information that is not that is not uh, available to them. So I don't know. thinking now like, before that I, I was thinking now and um, so what about so your blind learning techniques to find relevant tweets and to categorize them according to topics mm -hmm. but what about the implicit fair sourcing that there are in any social network like in Twitter you expect that the uh, relevant information has more retweets that the hashtags contain a lot of semantic information so uh, so we have used that, that kind of, yeah, that's a good point. So we have used some, for instance, the propagation of the tweet. We have used for uh, determining whether people are believing what they are tweeting, uh, whether, they, whether this propagates as a credible tweet or whether this propagates as something that people are hesitant about. Uh, but, but also we have some negative results. So for instance, uh, the, just, the, the, just the amount of retweet that something has it's not so much related to whether it's true or false. And we have like very false tweets that end up being retweeted a lot and very true things that end up being retweeted very little. So it, it helps for some, it, 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 it is information that needs to be used with care and it's not only the quantity, it's about the, the propagation tree, uh, maybe it's about the number of people involved, whether people change and so on. So there is, a, yeah, I, I, with that conversation, how that conversation evolves, um, yeah. of the population involved in the, in the practice because if they are uh, the age group, for example, it might mm, change significantly if, if there's much, uh, let's say, uh, um, European or... or so there are, there are cultural differences. Yeah, so there are, we, don't, we, don't we don't place that information in the models. But there are other people who have, uh, yeah, or yeah. And there are people who have observed like heavy cultural differences in, in response of these things. So, for instance, there is a very, I mean, very sharp div division. There is a study that um, between uh, uh, Jap uh, Japan and Pakistan, that like users in Pakistan trusting more social media than the government, and users in Japan pro uh, trusting more the government than social media, for instance. There is also there are also linguistic va variability, e even in the contents, right? So you may think that from the Philippines, uh, if you look at all the tweets in English and all the tweets in Tagalog, they will have like a similar composition, but it's not the case. They they are written for different audiences. So the tweets in English are written to a foreign audience, and they are uh, kind of expressing how uh, serious the situation is and try to inform others and so on. And the tweets in Tagalog are more interpersonal. They're about, okay, how is, you know, something about my cousin or, or this uh, local uh, singer or football star or whatever, like, so 
uh, even even within the same culture, the things that you say in one language and the things you say in another can be different. Good question. Yes. Have you done this kind of research in conflict areas or conflict zones? Where the people so the volunteer groups, they some volunteer groups tend to avoid human conflict because it endangers their own people, and they and also they see that there there, there is much more. Uh, deception. There, there, there are more, much more, many people trying to make you believe what you, what is not true. So human conflict is kind of we, we do some of it, and, and some of it is human conflict. But uh, it's it, the volunteer group are, are 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 hesitant to enter this space. Plus, you have much more uh, disinformation, like in, wrong information purposefully injected into the data. While in a natural disaster, there are Whenever you see somebody saying something that is false, most often it's it's just that they think that this is true and they are wrong. Like they 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 post about that tsunami warning because they think well, it, maybe it's true and if I don't post it, it's bad. But if I post it, maybe nothing happens. So it's a uh, yeah, human conflict is kind of a different. I mean, it has some similar techniques, but it has com extra complications. Um, Right, and there, so things that we have, uh, yeah, it's the same kind of people. There also there is some data protection thing to do, like for instance in the case of Syria, maps of Syria, what people do is that they, they delay the map. They have a public map that is uh, kind of two days old, and then a private map that is current. And in the public map, you don't show all the information, they just because there are factions in conflict, so you don't want to get them alert about somebody else. Also, there, there are cases where people try to retaliate against those who are posting information. So it's a kind of tricky, um, yeah, you need to kind of protect the data, the people, it's complicated. Yeah. Peter, Catherine, uh, how do you get the groups that you use this public database? We, we typically were using the public, uh, the, the streaming API, the filtering API, but we had to talk to Twitter a few times uh, they have a government and NGO division, not the division, person. They have a person who interacts with governments and NGOs, and that person authorizes some extra, they, uh, to be more lenient with someone because they believe this is uh, not a commercial enterprise, for instance. So it's usually asking for a bounding box? Bounding box, and, and a, a, we, in crisis legs, there is a vocabulary, these 380 words that are very repetitive used in English when there is a disaster situation. So we, we will use, a com for instance, sometimes a combination of words. Uh, in crisis legs, there is also a paper on this thing, like trying to mix. With a bounding box, you get a lot of recall, but you get very little precision. And with the hashtags of the event, you get like very high precision and very low recall. And you can find in the middle some trade-off where you incorporate more words uh, that are maybe relevant for the event, and you, but uh, but you still you 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 are gonna gather, you're gonna your position is gonna suffer, but at the, you will have higher recall. So it's um, it's it's, it's called the uh, in, in information retrieval it's called information filtering problem. You have a, you have a stream of data and you have to identify which are the queries that you're gonna do against this data to separate one part from another. It's it's a problem in itself. It's it's an interesting problem in itself. Good. Okay, thanks for coming. Great.